participants. Oh yeah, renamed. There I am. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Say <laughs> not Mary McCarthy. Gary, are you going to give me a signal or should I just... Um, yeah, just waiting for Sophie to turn the um, caption off, but we, we, we can go now. Okay. okay. Very good. Well, welcome to everybody. Welcome to our Zoom audience and our IDS YouTube audience to a very special webinar that comes at a rather crucial moment. So we're about a year into the COVID-19 crisis now. Um, and it's extraordinary to look back over this last year and, and realise how much of an intersecting crisis it's become. What started seemed to be a public health crisis has become a crisis which has genuinely exposed cracks in all the systems that we depend on um, and has exposed um, social and economic and political inequities of a kind that I think nobody had ever imagined. And so it's very timely, I think, that today we're launching um, an IDS bulletin which reflects on this aspect of the COVID-19 crisis as a set of intersecting crises and looks forward to say what could actually be built out of this? How has the crisis unfolded? But what are the opportunities that are there to do development differently, to build forward differently? And uh, the bulletin, um, which reflects on these issues, is launched today, is now available for, for people to see. And in this webinar, we're going to be hearing both from the, the co-editors of the bulletin and from a number of the speakers and contributors to the articles. Um, I just want to say something um, before handing over to those others about the very first piece in the bulletin, which actually looks at it as a public health crisis um, and is authored by Megan Schmitzane and the team from IDS's Social Science and Humanitarian Action Platform. Um, because in a way, this tries to set the public health stage a little bit, recognizing that what started as a public health crisis has actually turned out to be what the article calls a syndemic using this concept, which has been developed um, particularly by anthropologists as well as public health specialists 
to see how a health crisis, a health issue, intersects um, in its local context with inequities of various kinds, both around other health conditions and also around social and economic inequalities. And what that first article does is to explore the COVID-19 crisis as a syndemic and therefore to draw several quite important conclusions. One is that context really matters and a one size fit all, fits all approach um, to addressing a public health issue is simply not going to work. Secondly, that an integrated approach is needed, which draws together action across sectors. So health, um, multiple kinds of health, secondary health impacts, as well as COVID itself, um, but also agriculture, um, economy, um, food security and other areas. And then thirdly, that we need to think about integrating short term crisis response with longer term development perspectives. And I think those in a way that the, the first article sets the stage, but those are themes I think that run all the way through the bulletin. The only other thing I'd like to say is that this bulletin also um, comes out of a very special partnership um, and it's the partnership with Irish Aid, which has happened over nearly a decade and has intensified particularly over the last couple of years, as we've begun to see so strongly the, the synergies between IDS's strategy and our focus on transforming knowledge, transforming lives in the strategy we launched last year and Irish AIDS and, and Ireland's international development priorities and its focus on towards a better world. And I think Mary McCarthy and the discussants from Irish Aid will tell us a little bit more about that. But um, before I hand over to Peter, I'd just like to add my thanks to Irish Aid colleagues for this extremely special partnership and to say how pleased I am personally that we've been able to do this bulletin together as, as a kind of capstone of this phase in our work together and as a very key part of the broader work that IDS and partners are doing around thinking about transformations and a transformative moment for development um, around the COVID-19 crisis. So Peter, over to you at this point. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, really great introduction. And just before we get into the substance of the webinar, I'd also just like to add a few thanks as well uh, to a number of people who've made possible the special issue of the IDS Bulletin, which is now out today and can be downloaded uh, freely from the IDS website. Uh, it's called Building a Better World, the Crisis and Opportunity of COVID-19. And I just want to thank all the contributors. It's actually quite a number of people have written and uh, contributed their thoughts and their insights, which obviously in the last year have emerged in real time as the pandemic has raged globally. Uh, I also want to thank the reviewers who themselves represent a truly global group of thinkers and practitioners and gave us really excellent, insightful comments and feedback in a timely and helpful way. Uh, there is an entire IDS team who work incredibly hard behind the production of this bulletin and this webinar. In particular, thanks to Beth, Alison, Gary, Sophie, our copy editors, and many others who facilitated this process. And um, as Melissa said, I also just want to acknowledge the support of the government of Ireland and, and Irish Aid. And I particularly want to thank my co-editor, Mary McCarthy, who will be speaking shortly, for what's been a really excellent collaboration. Um, you know, there are some enterprises which are both productive, but also extremely enjoyable. And this has really honestly been one of those. So I'm very grateful for that as well. And just before I pass to Mary, just to get us going on the on the presentations, how we're going to run the session today, uh, Mary and I are just going to talk briefly on why this bulletin was important to bring together. And we'll share a few broad takeaways. Then we'll hear from some of the contributors. Um, just to note that, unfortunately, because of time, it's not possible to have all the contributors pre present in the webinar but there will be other opportunities to hear from authors via short interviews, other pieces, blogs, and of course in the bulletin itself, which uh, we really hope everybody will, will read. Um, and then I'll be introducing each speaker briefly. You'll be able to find more information about all the speakers in the bulletin. And after the short presentations, we'll hear some short reflections from Michelle Winthrop, who is Policy Director at Irish Aid, at which point we'll turn back to Melissa, uh, who will help to facilitate a bit of interaction of uh, the time that we have available. And if you do have questions or comments, please put them into the chat. That would be great. So, Mary, over to you. 
Thank you, Peter and Melissa, and uh, hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us at this virtual launch. We had hoped it would be in person, but these are the times that we are in. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here on behalf of Irish Aid um, to, to launch this really, this really significant and we think very timely um, output from the IDS Irish Aid Strategic Partnership. Um, and in launching the bulletin today, um, what I wanted to do very briefly in my short time at the start is just to outline the rationale for why we have produced this bulletin at this point in time um, and, and kind of the purpose of it, the, what we hoped would achieve um, and what we hope to do with the uh, in curating the different thinking and analysis um, to go beyond that simply being words on a page and to really contribute to our thinking uh, and how we are thinking our way through this current crisis. Uh, in setting this out, I thought it would be useful to, um, to go back a year, as Melissa has said at the start, we are now at the one year anniversary of COVID-19 being declared a global pandemic. Um, and I know certainly from, um, from my own context a year ago, even one or two weeks into the first lockdown in Ireland, already there was a sense of nostalgia for what was before, uh, you know, kind of a drive to we just need to get through this and then we can get back to normal. Um, and that drive, that yearning to get back to normal has probably increased in the intervening year. Um, but of course, what this bulletin highlights for all of us is the, the stark fact that the status quo pre-COVID was not serving us well. And indeed that the pandemic has turbocharged pre-existing inequalities um, that have played out in a number of different ways. And of course, impacted on those people with the least capacity and resilience to tap into in terms of, re of a response. I think secondly, um, what's important to note a year on is um, a year ago, we were probably still conceptualizing COVID-19 um, in a fairly linear fashion. And I think this bulletin responds to that. So we were thinking about the onset of the crisis, the immediate crisis response, medium term recovery, and then building back better. Again, probably harking back to an assumption that we would revert to what was before. Um, and I think um, what comes across in the different articles in the bulletin is not only the complexity of the crisis we are now facing, which is truly global in nature, although playing out in very different ways in terms of impacts, um, but it's also circular. Um, so linear thinking is not going to get us to where we need to be. And what we hope it provides us with are, is, is analysis, yes, and tools, but also real lessons from communities um, uh, in how uh, we can potentially think differently in navigating this uncertainty, this circularity, and, and this complexity, uh, which is as hard as it sounds, but it requires all of us um, to commit to deliberately thinking through and applying certain principles. Uh, and these are the ones I just wanted to draw your attention to now in opening this webinar. Um, and I'm conscious of the bulletin itself. It's vast, it's wide ranging, and that's great, but you will be dipping in and out. But some of the key principles that come through all of the different articles. One is, of course, it mirrors Ireland's um, development cooperation priority to reach those who are furthest behind first. So those who are most marginalized and most vulnerable must be at the forefront of our thinking when we are trying to uh, develop new and different ways of responding to the kind of the circularity and the complexity. And secondly, the importance of investing in systems that serve those people. So that systems must serve communities and that systems are not there to be ultra lean and efficient at all times. They must of course be efficient, but they must also have capacity built into them in order to be able to flex and respond at a time of crisis. So be that in food systems or health systems or social protection systems. And I know many of our speakers in the panel will talk about those specifically. So um, five minutes goes very quickly. So I'll be, I'll be good, Peter, and stop here. But just thank you all once again for your contributions, in particular to my colleagues in Irish Aid and in the, the, the broader Department of Foreign Affairs uh, for contributing to some of the thinking and articles in particular here and to our colleagues in the IDS uh, and looking forward to a really good discussion. Back to you, Peter. Great, thanks, Mary. And I think, uh, as you said yourself, that if we're really going to address those deep underlying structural cracks and tensions that Melissa noted in her introduction, and which we know that the pandemic has exposed so clearly, we need to see changes and also be making choices that actually address the interconnectedness of multidimensional aspects of poverty, inequality and injustice. 
And in the bulletin, there's a wealth of evidence and analysis from a number of different countries, including India, Tanzania, Sierra Leone, Kenya, Ethiopia, and many others. And looking at the impact of the pandemic on universal development challenges, which include health systems, food equity, social protection, gender equality, local governance, and freedom of religion or belief. Now, when we looked across all the contributions, um, Mary and I as co-editors, I think we saw that the bulletin really showed that donors and policy actors in particular can help through a number of different actions. Firstly, to prioritize those who are furthest behind first through inclusive and deliberative planning processes. To think longer term, but laying the groundwork for transformative approaches in the immediate short-term response. By localizing strategies, by responding to diverse and specific contexts, and really importantly, enabling collaboration. By effective coordination with key actors and researchers across sectors, integrating perspectives, methods, and disciplines. By pursuing and promoting flexible adaptive approaches that can respond to uncertainty and complexity, which are characteristics of our present and for sure will be of our future. And also establishing really firm foundations for comprehensive social protection, stronger health systems, and also building the resilience of food systems. And if this crisis has taught us anything, it's about the importance of not simply reacting to events that have materialized, but also in anticipating and predicting likely future shocks and building in capacity to deal with sudden surges. This is challenging, but the bulletin, we hope, helps us understand better where we've come from and where we may be heading by offering practical examples of community resilience, experimentation, innovation, and collective action. And there really is a sense of hope by demonstrating that it is genuinely possible to build forward differently. So let's hear now from some of our contributors on what they can bring to this conversation. I'd like to start with Katie Rowland, who is an IDS research fellow, and she has contributed one of the articles on social protection. Katie. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Mary. It's um, really exciting to be part of the launch today of this bulletin with uh, such a rich collection of articles. Um, and I'm very honored to be presenting our piece on social protection, which was co-authored with Jeremy Lind and um, Rachel Sabatas Wheeler. And the three of us together last year started thinking about um, social protection in relation to COVID-19 and how social protection can contribute to building better, but also how the crisis might be an opportunity for social protection to be built back better. And so in the five minutes I have, I'd like to highlight three points um, from what we've written in the article, but maybe also in terms of what we've learned since, because it's so fast moving and a lot has happened. So first of all, I think uh, the COVID-19 crisis has really been a wake up call for social protection. Of course, there was already a lot going on before the pandemic, but the pandemic has also led to an unprecedented expansion of social protection. Uh, there's been various counts and summary documents keeping track of all the efforts. And in December 2020, uh, the count said that there were more than 1,200 new measures or expanded measures around the world when it comes to social protection to help people deal with the socioeconomic fallout of COVID. And cash transfers were by and large the most popular instrument. Now, many of these interventions covered and extended to populations that were previously unserved or underserved with social protection. And probably the most prominent example of this is informal workers and particularly in urban areas. There's been a real recognition that uh, these groups do not traditionally fall within target uh, groups of social protection, but that they were especially vulnerable to the pandemic. And so uh, many schemes that have been put in place or have been expanded have now pulled in this population. And there's been a lot of learning around um, how these groups can be included and how they can benefit from social protection. So COVID-19 has really highlighted vulnerabilities and has been said pre-existing inequalities that were previously overlooked um, and has emphasized the need that social protection needs to cover everyone. And so as such, it's really given impetus to this discussion about universal social protection with systems um, including everyone uh, if and when they need it. The second point 
um, that I think is important to flag and speaks to some of what Mary has also highlighted, which is that social protection needs to be more than just a short term response. As we highlight in the article, um, many of the interventions that were put in place in response to the pandemic were implemented mostly as a one off support premised on this idea that we we have this um, um, pandemic coming in and then it will slowly fade out and we can go back to normal, hopefully with some expanded form of social protection. But we heard that there is no space for linear thinking and definitely reality in the last years is, is um, showing that as well with lots of flare ups of infection rates, multiple waves and COVID staying with us for quite some time to come. And social protection needs to respond to that appropriately with adaptive and shock responsive systems so that there's a continuum of response for individuals, households and communities as they are affected by COVID, but also other shocks into the future. And this then builds um, quite a lot of ongoing work that tries to build those linkages between social protection and humanitarian support, uh, which has been a growing area of work um, also at IDS with the basic program. So a lot of efforts there, and I think COVID has really once again highlighted the need that social protection is vital to help people cope with shocks and that systems need to be able to do that appropriately. And then the third point that I'd like to pick up on is that building back better with social protection also means getting the basics right for social protection. Um, so experiences with those new interventions or those expanded interventions in response to COVID have shown that those schemes that were underpinned by strong systems, whether that's identification or targeting, payment or coordination, they were rolled out much more quickly and were also more effective at reaching people and probably also more effective at creating impact, although the evidence base was still building. And so learning lessons from implementing these new schemes at scale in such a short period of time is an opportunity to get foundations right for the future as social protection systems and programs are being expanded. And that includes strong accountability mechanisms and also linkages to other sectors uh, such as health, education and so on. Two vital other elements to, to highlight here, I think. One is the creation of fiscal space and making sure that there's enough funding. This has always been an issue for social protection, but will be even more vital when wanting to expand, particularly because many countries will experience economic downturn. And finally, it will be important to keep an eye on making sure that social protection is inclusive and indeed includes those furthest behind. I would say in the expansion of social protection in response to COVID, that hasn't always happened. There's been a real rush to expand to large groups of people that were underserved or unserved, but it could well be that most marginalized and most uh, hard to reach groups um, were, were not uh, effectively reached and that needs to be kept in mind. So final words. I think COVID-19 can definitely be an opportunity for social protection to build back better. Uh, the wave of interventions that was implemented has given social protection a lot of renewed momentum and traction. And really now it's up to national governments, international donors and agencies, as well as other stakeholders to seize the opportunity and uh, continue that momentum on social protection. Thank you. Excellent, Katie, thanks so much. Okay, let's now move to Sohela Nazni, who is another IDS research fellow, and she has contributed the article to the bulletin on gender. Sohela, over to you. Uh, thank you, Peter and Mary, for asking me to speak today, but also thanks to IDS and Irish Aid for enabling myself and Susanna Araujo, who's my co-author, to uh, write this article. So uh, our article focuses on gender equality and whether building, if you want to build back better, how do you put gender equality at its core? And what are the dilemmas that arise? Partly we look at in terms of talking about dilemmas because the feminist collectives that we were working with uh, are worried that we will actually go back to business as usual or that building back better would be built on women's backs. So. I have three things that I want to point out. The first message is we are at the risk of losing the gains that we made on gender equality and women's rights. 
and that spans across sectors. We know about the impact on health, and this is a public health emergency, but when you cut down on secondary health services, sexual and reproductive health is affected, outreach services are affected, and that affects women and girls quite a lot. Uh, we know about the silent pandemic, which is the rise in domestic violence incidents across the world, but there are also other types of risks and gender-based violence in contexts that are quite fragile. For example, trafficking in girls have gone up. Um, there are also other issues in terms of women's economic empowerment. So sectors have been hit hard where it's female dominated, for example, service sectors, but there are also vulnerable groups of people, women migrant workers, women refugees, um, women in informal sectors who don't have formal job security who are being hit hard. And the burden of care has gone up for all classes. It's not just about homeschooling. There are other types of care work that you need to take care of and attend to the elderly and the sick and while also try to be economically active. So it's a stretch. And Lastly, of course, there, there are the issues that these things are interconnected, so you just can't address one separately. So that's one message of, of the bulletin that it looks at, the article that looks at the impact. The second thing that it talks about is how are we doing or how have we done? So the article obviously has data up till September, but things have also progressed since then. So how are we doing? Um, not very well. There is a global tracker that UNIFEM has, and we in globally we have 225 task forces and women are only 24 percent of these task forces and mainly in europe and latin america uh, and the caribbean there are places in the world women are not part of these many sites of power where decisions are being taken um, the second bit in terms of, yes, social protection has been ramped up. If you analyze it, only 11% of them actually take unpaid care into account. Uh, that's a very important area if you want gender equality. Um, domestic violence sort of measures around that. The rhetoric is there. Government and others are talking about it. When you really analyze it and see what is being done, not enough. It, given the scale of the problem. So we are already falling behind and we, we really need to push hard. So that brings me to the third message of the bulletin, which is how do we do it? And you already heard that it's kind of circular, it's not linear. But one aspect is of course, when you're facing an emergency crisis, how do you ensure that you have an understanding of the gender specific impact of the crisis with an intersectional lens? Not all women are affected in the same way. They're affected different way, differently, depending on elderly, whether you're a minority woman, whether you're domestic, your class position, et cetera. So how do we ensure that our emergency measures are taking the different vulnerabilities into account? And the bulletin talks about that. The second bit is if you're gonna build in terms of medium and long-term, both for the donor agencies and policymakers and at the national level, you need three types of capacity. One is, your technical capacity to do gender analysis and focus on on the problems second is your fiscal capacity because you do have to invest third is of course the political will to do so and it varies across contexts and for us to build the capacity and to take the measures we really need to think where are the progressive alliances because this is a political decision and the last message that I want to leave you with, and this comes from the Canadians, which is basically that we are, there is no recovery unless there is a she recovery. This is, this pandemic has had grave impact on women and girls. It is a gendered pandemic. I'm not saying men are not affected, but we are not gonna recover or move back from business as usual, unless we focus on she recovery. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Sohila, and that's a great, uh, a great phrase as well, which uh, we should take to our hearts and take away from this event also. Now, moving on to our next presenters, Ayako Ebata and Nick Nisbet, Nisbet uh, both IDS Research Fellows, and they have contributed to the article on food equity, and I think, Ayako, uh, I'll pass to you. Thank you, Peter. And once again, uh, thanks very much for Irish Aid and also Ideas Organizers for hosting this event as well as helping us through the bulletin articles. Um, so I'm presenting our work on food systems, which was co-authored by Nick Nisbet, as well as Stuart Gillespie, who are both here today. 
Um, if there is one message to take away from our part of the presentation, then it is about equity in food system resilience. And I'll talk about that in the next five minutes. Um, across the world and over the last year, you have seen uh, sweeping measures to, uh, that were put in place in order to um, slow down the spread of coronavirus. And uh, we have seen a lot of measures that are affecting food systems as well um, as in other sectors. So for example, we've seen a lot of closures of markets, social distancing rules have affected a number of different actors within the food, food systems, as well as people's accessibility to healthy and nutritious food. Um, what we're seeing and what we continue to see today is a series of ripple effects, let's say. So this public health crisis like COVID-19 has um, affected different parts of supply chain and their functionality. And, and as Sohela actually quite nicely said, they, they are also affecting care arrangements within families and households um, and the social networks beyond that. Um, which then affected the accessibility to healthy food, as well as information and the support that they were marginalized people were able to access before the crisis rolled in. And basically all uh, what this is all telling us is that the food systems and other systems are lacking resilience. And this is not necessarily a new piece of work that we have done or anybody else has done a relation to COVID-19, but it has been talked about in terms of climate change and other sustainability issues within food systems and beyond. Um, so resilient systems, resilient food systems are able to absorb, respond to, and recover and potentially also thrive from shocks like COVID-19. And it's actually quite important to thinking about, about thriving from crisis and making this as an opportunity. However, um, Resilience thinking can lead to further marginalization of already marginalized group of people. And that's obviously what we're talking about in this bulletin article, as well as the webinar. And in order to avoid that, and again, thriving from crisis to work, to, to make a system that works for the marginalized and the furthest left behind, we need to think about equitable food systems as well as resilience in it. Um, what do we mean by this? Basically, um, what, what we argue in this article is that equitable and resilient food systems need to evaluate who wins and loses, who are the winners and losers of whatever interventions that we are putting in place, we are considering um, in the political spectrum. Um, and that, that would hopefully lead to interventions that can support the most, uh, most in need. Uh, we analyze this from two particular topics, uh, which are malnutrition and food, food systems, uh, jobs and related poverty. So first of all, to tackle malnutrition, we, um, we suggest a holistic approach that takes into account these individuals' care environments as a social, social being rather than just an individual person living in the individualistic life, let's say. So for example, um, access to healthy food requires individuals to have time, but that is cru crucially related to the kinds of job that she or he has. If you don't have enough time to make healthy food at home, obviously you're not going to be able to supply that to your families. Um, and also the wider water and sanitation environment is very critical in making sure that individuals don't get diseases and other uh, health, health conditions from consuming food. We also criticize, um, uh, critically analyze that there is overemphasis on these individual uh, based interventions, but also focus on staple commodities um, and increasing the quantity of staple commodities. And this has been talked about as a uh, uh, syllable bu bullet points for food security, but we argue that this is not necessary enough to build back from COVID-19. When it comes to the income generating uh, activities within food systems and poverty from food systems perspective, addressing systemic barriers for people to access resources as well as information is very critical. This can be uh, general remoteness that is common amongst particular groups of people who tend to be marginalized, um, but also access to information at the time of crisis and beyond. Um, 
And then we also um, argue for fostering local capacity to innovate and communicate information across relevant stakeholders. And finally, uh, we emphasize the importance of political influence to tailor interventions um, that support the most marginalized people. So let me stop here. And if there's any questions, uh, we would be happy to address. Thank you. Thanks, Ayako. And um, if new questions do come up later, I'm, I know we have Nick Nisbet also here, uh, and I'm sure that both you and he will be able to, to give a word uh, before the end as well. So thanks for that. Now, in the bulletin, we have a number of uh, papers which look at real, really thematic issues. We've heard a number of those represented today. And we have also some contributors who are based in a number of countries who have really shared experiences from the ground to help us understand better what the implications of COVID are really playing out at national levels. So now I'm very happy to ask Kim Wamello, who is Reproductive Health and Nutrition Program Manager at the Embassy of Ireland, Tanzania, and contributed one of those papers um, looking at enhancing nutrition in Tanzania to share your thoughts with us. Kim. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, thank you for all the brilliant work that you and Mary have done on this. And for all the participants, thank you for taking your time to be with us. So it was been quite interesting being the last, the near the last to speak, because a lot of our lessons are actually quite similar to what has been learned from the global space. Um, I think talking back to the country level perspective, one of the key lessons coming out from our experience has been the need to rapidly respond at the local level based on the local context of, of, of the pandemic. Um, and this really needs resilient health systems that can then be leveraged on to respond to the pandemic while um, still addressing the needs, particularly of the most vulnerable. Um, in Tanzania, for example, Irish aid um, supports a broad range of interventions at local level, in including um, community system strengthening primary healthcare services. Um, and based on the local context, we have um, interventions around gender-based violence, gender equality, um, water and sanitation, as Ayako had mentioned, and social protection. And so one of the things that we're able to do really quickly is leverage all of these interventions to provide relatively holistic services to um, the communities that we work with. Um, there is an important need to safeguard the services, particularly of essential services, particularly for women and children. Um, Tanzania's healthcare system is already quite over, overburdened and under-resourced, and there is a significant risk of the entire system shifting to address COVID-19 and essential services dropping off of the map. Um, in order to be able to safeguard services, it needs a bit of flexibility, adaptability, and learning from the actual situation on the ground. And I think, Melissa, you touched on this in your introduction quite well, that um, the actual local context differs, differs significantly. However, that doesn't mean that we should not try to ensure services are available. Um, our focus primarily is on women and children. And so depending on the areas that we're working in, this meant maybe identifying locations in health facilities for people to access care, maybe one-on-one -on -one services in the community, maybe a combination of all of these. Um, essential for us was as well protecting healthcare providers, speaking to the resource of, of uh, the healthcare resources. And we do have nearly half deficit um, healthcare system in terms of human resources. And so looking at the system as a whole rather than separate chunks and ensuring that the needs of the most vulnerable, particularly women and children for us in Tanzania is key. I've talked quite a lot about local level action, but just before I close, I'd like to finish on issues on coherence and coordination, particularly from a donor perspective um, around interventions that are designed and are supported need to a, align with national government plans and policies, but also there is a role there for, for policymakers to ensure that our investments and our support also aligns to best practice globally. Um, but there is also need for coordination within the donor space and within the donor communities to ensure that we're all working on separate pieces of a whole um, rather than multiple different projects coexisting in the same in the same physical space. And um, so I really think that this conversation has been very timely and I'm looking forward to learning a bit more after reading the wonderful bulletin um, and happy to answer any questions in case there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. 
So we've now heard from our contributors, and I'm just really glad that this session is being recorded and will be available afterwards because there's such a wealth of insights and experience being shared. Uh, and now an, an unenviable task, I'm going to pass to Michelle Winthrop, uh, Policy Director at Irish Aid, just to share some, a sort of a, a sense, Michelle, of what are you taking away from all of this? Uh, and to you know, give us some further thoughts to, to consider as, as hopefully everybody will read the bulletin. Um, thank you so much, Peter. Gosh, yes, unenviable indeed. Um, I think the, the biggest takeaway really is, is and, and it has been repeated a few times, is that actually this represents an opportunity to fundamentally reframe um, how, how we are approaching development, how we see it, how we identify problems, and how we bring about solutions. The sustainable development goals are still valid. The framing of the goals is still right. But I think we are, I think we're all agreed on this, this uh, statement that's in the bulletin, you know, nothing could be worse than a return to normality. And everybody's relationships have fundamentally been altered for the last year. People's relationships with nature, people's relationships with their governments, people's relationships with each other, with their families. And I think we should build on that. I think we should take this opportunity and, and really push ahead for a, a sort of turbocharging of creativity and lesson learning. Um, to give you an example, indeed, in, in Ireland, uh, only today the government has announced that we're going to try to use the, the, the beloved rural Irish pub as an opportunity for, for remote working, actually. And, you know, those buildings that would be empty during the day, because people in the pub during the day isn't a good thing, right? Let's use those as an opportunity to pull people out of the cities and, and use those spaces productively and allow people to, to reconnect with their sense of home. So, you know, that kind of creative thinking, I think, is, is really what we should be pushing for. Some of the threads I think I picked up on, I think that this point about the pandemic bringing into sharp focus the barriers um, to people accessing services and, and really the identification of those marginalized people what what it means to be furthest behind first and, and what it is that, that that puts you in that category we're seeing it in terms of gender but we're also seeing it in terms of you know ethnic minorities religious minorities um, people whose whose faces don't fit and I think we're really beginning to learn how we can take a, a, a sort of people-centered approach and, and engage those marginalized groups in the, in the process of, of policy making. I would contend, and, and you might expect me to say this as, as a representative of the Irish government, I would contend that human rights is, is back as a concept. You know, often rights gets kind of pushed to one side as a bit complicated and a bit theoretical. Actually, if you frame the challenge in terms of basic human rights, um, it, it really does start to, to help you prioritize. Um, many colleagues have mentioned that the interconnectivity across our various uh, areas of work, people do not live their lives in sectors. And indeed, if you take a, a, a people-centered approach or a household-centered approach, family-centered approach, you can start to build public policy and deliver services in such a way that, that, that they interact with each other for, for well-being outcomes over and above economic prosperity. We are, something that hasn't come up as much and, and something I'm slightly obsessed with is, is that the pandemic has brought about a change, I think, in intergenerational dynamics too. Uh, it has brought about a conversation about what a quality childhood means it has brought about a conversation about aging and how we age and how we provide support for those people who are at the latter stages of their lives. And, and I think that, again, is, is something we should um, seize upon, really, for an honest conversation with ourselves about, about how, we, uh, how we deliver from the cradle to the grave. And that goes back to the universal social protection point. For Ireland as well, I think it's taught us that we have to move a little bit beyond our money as donors and and the aid program should be the money plus plus and and indeed our learning our expertise our own experiences um, developed countries I think have been reminded that we are uh, all in a process of development and and you know the pandemic has set us back on so many levels um, 
that, that we've had to re-question some stuff too. So I think it's, it's brought us into that space where the universality of the sustainable development goals really is meaningful and not just a kind of token political signal. And then the last point I would make um, is that I, I believe very strongly that the pandemic has brought multilateralism back into focus. How we feel about multilateral institutions, our degree of ownership of them, uh, whether we are for them or against them, you know, at least it's brought a bit of energy into that conversation around the role of multilaterals. Who would have thought that in a year's time, practically everybody could name the senior management team of the World Health Organization? Um, you know, and yet here we are. Um, the European Union, as, as will be of no surprise to anyone, I think is really asking itself some difficult questions around our internal versus our external priorities as a bloc. So it, it, it's, it's proving a bit of a, I believe, a bit of a, a junction, a reflective junction when it comes to multilateralism as well. And, and as you all know, that's something that the Irish government holds very dear. But I would say learning is the most important thing that we can do in this phase. And, and, and so on that basis, I'd like to really express my sincere thanks to IDS for, for, for a fantastic initiative and a fantastic way of, of weaving it all together. We, we, I know, have really benefited from the process and, and I know we will benefit massively from the product too. So thank you so much. Um, Michelle, thank you so much for those remarks and speakers, thank you also so much for your comments and also for keeping to time, which does leave us around 10 or 15 minutes to look at some of the questions which are coming up in the chat. And I would encourage people to keep posting questions in the chat. So I'm, I'm now going to read out just a couple of them and perhaps suggest who might, who might respond. So um, we've got an interesting question here from Ray Hirayama who asks all the panelists um, about the intersection between quite complex social protection issues as they've unfolded in earlier um, ostensibly health crises, HIV, Ebola, others, other infectious diseases, and is wondering to what extent um, the COVID crisis and perhaps particularly the social protection response has been able to draw on learning from some of these earlier sort of intersecting health and other crises. So that might be one for Katie, if you could, could come back to that one and offer us some thoughts. And then there's a question to Sahela um, from Alex Vandy, who asked you to kind of, in a way, sum up a little bit what you've said about, um, is COVID-19 an opportunity or a crisis for gender-based violence or for action against gender-based violence, depending on which way you take it? So. It would be good to, to hear that. Um, and then I wonder, I mean, if who might like to pick up? We've got two interesting questions about kind of furthest behind first, but who who needs to be prioritized? So so we heard from Sahela the call for this to be a she covery. Um, Nick Nisbet is saying, I would also say we need a child-centered recovery. Um, and then Mary Wickenden um, has said, waving a flag for people with disabilities who, as predicted by many, have also had their marginalization and underprivilege and disadvantage exacerbated by COVID. And of course, people living with disabilities are often um, the, the biggest but the most marginalized of so-called minority groups. So um, I wonder, I mean, if, if one or two of you would like to reflect on this in a sense, who are we prioritizing if we're thinking about the furthest behind first? Who is actually furthest behind? And, and perhaps how do we deal with what are intersecting forms of marginalization and prioritizing those? So that might be something maybe perhaps for Mary to pick up on in terms of how Irish Aid thinks about these things. So let's have some, some responses. Maybe Katie, if you want to start on the social protection one. Sure, thank you, Melissa. Um, so a very interesting question, and I'll, I'll reflect on it specifically from the perspective of lessons with, uh, with, H with respect to HIV. Um, and I think there are lessons that were learned from that response um, and, and thinking about how social protection can then respond to COVID. Um, I think first off, it, I, I think it's been an important one to um, really instigate the social protection response to COVID. There's been many lessons from 
uh, the response to HIV in terms of how effective social protection and particularly cash transfers can be in um, helping people affected by HIV and, for example, in adhering to their medication, but also preventing infection in certain groups. Um, so I think that evidence has really helped also promote this response. I think a second lesson is probably around targeting. I think a lot of lessons within uh, HIV sensitive social protection have shown that very stringent targeting, so really trying to limit the group to those who are most affected, can also have a backlash and negative consequences. And, and I'm thinking particularly here around stigma uh, on which we've also done a separate piece of work. And that actually relates also to responses to other infectious diseases such as Ebola, where very stringent targeting and singling out of groups and people uh, can really undermine the effectiveness of this support. Um, and I think maybe that's also played into some of the, the wide sweeping response uh, that we've seen in this case with respect to social protection. Um, I would also like to point out one thing that I think is quite different from uh, other um, pandemics, if you will, and that is the sheer scale of this crisis, uh, the scale of the socioeconomic consequences that I think is unlike anything we've seen before. And that's not just at national level, but also the connections between the national and the international. So global supply chains being disrupted, meaning that garment workers in Bangladesh or uh, workers in, in flower nurseries in Ethiopia and Kenya having lost their jobs, etc. I think that's very much unlike other crises where I think there's a lot of learning uh, from COVID. Excellent. So Hella, do you want to pick up on the, the gender-based violence point? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Alex. That is, a, that is an interesting question. Do we look at what are the problems or do we think about how do we move forward? Um, in a sense, whether COVID-19 is an opportunity to address and change the way we address gender-based violence uh, is, depends on how we respond to what is going on. I mean, no doubt COVID-19 is a unique scenario. I mean, you have prolonged lockdowns, you're locked, for example, let's take domestic violence. So you're, you can't go anywhere, the services are suspended, and obviously your exposure to risk of domestic violence rises. And then different kinds of gender-based violence would have different types of risks being heightened because of cuts in service because of uh, how we sort of set up redressal measures and it's not usually the way it functions, right? But having said that, there has been innovative practices. So for example, for women to sort of text emojis to the crisis um, sort of hotlines instead of having to type a whole message if they are in close quarters with the perpetrators or on camera court and digital processes in places which didn't have them or were slower to put in these measures. Um, repurposing hotels for domestic violence shelters, you know, things, things have been done, but things have been done sort of in a localized manner selectively and not sort of thinking in a coordinated way. So the question for us at the national level, but also sort of in terms of thinking about it, the international policy space is that how do we learn from these examples and how do we ramp it up because violence against women is not going to go away and it is going to be heightened as we face increased their increased poverty and economic stress so we need to think uh, out of the box and it is an opportunity to think out of the box i think yeah okay excellent so um, I wonder who'd like to pick up on these questions about sort of intersecting forms of disadvantage and, and how those might be addressed. I mean, perhaps Mary and also Kim, I don't know if you'd like to offer any thoughts from the national perspective in Tanzania about gender, disability, child-centeredness. How does one work with these intersecting forms of marginalization? Kim, do you want to pop in and I'll let then supplement, or do you want me to give the kind of the, the more overarching view first? Sure. Um, just to um, speak on the issue around gender and the response, um, I think one of the government's initial early priorities was to mitigate the impact or the increased GBV, the expected increased GBV during this time, especially in light of 
the fact that economic activities would have been interrupted. It was still uncertain whether or not there would be a lockdown. And so um, one of the things that we supported really early and the government prioritized was to have a hotline that was for Corona, but had a specific um, response and responses around gender-based violence. And interestingly, the gender-based violence component of that was used a lot more than the um, the broader um, coronavirus response. I think um, around disabilities, there's still quite a lot of work to be done there. There's national frameworks, of course, and, and a lot of work being done around, for instance, ensuring that um, speeches and stuff are um, able, are made in a way that they're accessible for people, perhaps with um, some disabilities. Um, I do think that there is a lot of work um, and just... I think we've lost Kim connection. From the Sub-Saharan African continent. Right. I think we're probably possibly losing Kim. I don't know if Mary was as anything in particular to disidentify um, some of these women. Um, uh, my apologies. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry, friends. Just final issue around data, data disaggregation, the avail availability of data around disability for planning and for implementation to be able to actually identify, as Mary had said, that is a huge challenge still. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And Mary, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add either on that point or, or just more generally as a final remark. Yeah, not a huge amount to add to Kim's intervention. I'm glad the, the connection caught up. But I suppose it's just to make the point that when we're talking about furthest behind first, we are talking about real people, that we need to get beyond just the rhetoric of this being a batch somewhere here. And it's also about more than simply targeting. Um, because of course, if you're designing an intervention for somebody else, it doesn't stand much of a chance of actually being correct or useful or sustainable in any way. So it's about, when we talk about, I think, disadvantage, it is the intersection. So it's not just all women, it may be women in particular situations and contexts who are in a particular ethnic minority group, the intersection with disability as some people have made the point in the chat box as well. So it is the intersection of different factors that, that cause marginalization. Mm -hmm. And it's also those voices that are silenced from, um, from discussion, from discourse and from decision making. So all of us have blind spots. I'm sure, you know, the, the, so it's about ensuring that we have we are listening to those voices of people who are most affected. So if those are malnourished children, who is speaking for those children? And how, where are we hearing those voices and how are we factoring them in? It's women who can't access healthcare. It's smallholder farmers. Um, it's ethnic minorities. We're, so so it's, I think there's been some interesting research recently on uh, the, the kind of gender makeup of COVID-19 task teams around the world and the dearth of female voices uh, on in terms of the public health response in different national governments with really disastrous responses. So if people who are most affected are not at the heart of decision making and design, then really we need to start over again. And that I think needs to be at the centre of this sort of transformational thinking and response that we are right. Well, I think that's a really important point to underline as we move towards the end. So we're running out of time. I just want to draw attention to two final points which are coming up in the chat and also appeared, I think, in all of the discussion and indeed in Michelle's remarks. Um, and one of them is about the importance of the local. So we are seeing the, I think, across all these questions of intersecting issues, the local context really matters and who's involved and the way these patterns of disadvantage and these intersections play out are really going to differ. And I think as, as Haley is pointing out in the chat and as the first health focus piece in the bulletin um, pointed out, there's still so much we don't know even within the health sector about how COVID is intersecting with other health conditions. And that's going to be really important to know and be able to respond to into the future especially as COVID becomes an endemic disease, which seem, seems very likely. So the local absolutely matters. And Mary, as you've said, involving the furthest behind in those local decision-making processes is vital. But so too does the global. And I very much agree with Michelle's remarks about COVID has pointed to 
a new prospect of kind of multilateralism and global solidarities. At the same time, it's also revealed, I think, the strains in those. And there's an interesting intervention in the chat about what we're seeing around vaccine nationalism and countries actually turning in on themselves at a moment of crisis as well. And I think the, this, this double tension is going to be something to watch out for over the next period. Also over this next year, when of course the world is going to need to come together around climate change um, and around the economy more generally in a post COVID moment. Um, I'm very aware that the UK is hosting both the G7 and COP26. And I think my final point, again, picking up on a lot of what others have said is about universalism. I think if this bullet, if the COVID crisis shows us anything, if the bulletin shows us anything, it's that, that the challenges, the crises, the opportunities affect everybody everywhere in different ways. And the UK and Ireland have as much to learn as Tanzania or Bangladesh or any of the other places and contexts which are discussed in this bulletin. So um, this emphasis on learning and moving forward collectively, I think is really vital. So thank you so much to all the contributors to the bulletin, those who are here today and have presented, those who are not here, encourage everybody to read it. There are some really great articles there. Keep the conversation going and enormous thank you to, to Mary and to Peter and to Irish Aid for enabling this partnership, which has produced this and made the conversations continue. Thank you all so much.